This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and yet another action-packed week of news at Boca Chica with Starship Development, that being some exciting super heavy construction finally being spotted, the SN7.1 prototype test to destruction, and more awesome news about the first prototype that should fly over 18 kilometers or 60,000 feet in altitude. Yep, Starship SN8, that is getting closer. Along with that, some interesting news with Firefly Alpha, Relativity Space, and NASA. Down the now. A week packed full of action at SpaceX in Boca Chica, Texas. Last weekend kicked off with weather alerts due to Tropical Storm Beta in the Gulf of Mexico. With storm surge and tropical winds forecasted, the nose cones were brought inside one of the tents and SN5 and SN6 took cover inside the yet to be completed high bay, providing protection from the deteriorating weather conditions. This view here provided quite the sense of scale as SN5 and SN6 were dwarfed by by the immense height of the high bay. As it turns out, the path of the storm headed north towards Houston, meaning that Boca Chica was left unaffected and work resumed as normal with the nose cones being brought back outside. The production facility has been a hive of activity as always of course. On Tuesday, SN8 was rolled out of the mid bay to make way for the aft flap installations of which were installed on the side of the vehicle later that day. Just days later we saw SpaceX complete an actuation test of the flaps, folding them inwards 90 degrees. Nice little shot there by Lab Padre. On this close up of the flap here we can see the attachment points on each end that connect the flap to the body of SN8 as well as the actuator in the middle. Fun in fact, this moment happened almost exactly one year after Mark 1's flaps were installed, from Mark 1 to SN8 in just a year. How about that? Now all that's left now is nose cone stacking and forward flap installation. SN8 will be rolled to the pad in the coming days, and then a cryogenic nitrogen proof test will be performed to verify the vehicle. If this test is successful, then according to Elon, SN8 will perform a static fire, check out another static fire, and then the moment we've all been waiting for. The 60,000 foot or 18 kilometer flight. More exciting news at the facility is that the first section of Super Heavy Serial Number 1 has finally been spotted. Mary spotted this three tank stack here with a label saying COM Barrel ASSY Booster. We're assuming this means that this is the common barrel assembly for the booster or essentially a common dome sleeve. The speculated placement of this section can be seen in Brendan's diagram here. It's still believed that there will be two Raptor engines that will fly this first prototype test. And speaking of the Raptor engines, SpaceX tweeted this great shot of the previously announced vacuum engine variant undergoing a test fire. All appears to have gone well there with Elon responding to Tim Dodd's question about flow separation, saying that you can see a little towards the end of the nozzle. Of course, being a vacuum engine, efficiency is not going to be perfect at sea level, but these these tests show that there should be improvements to come. Elon talked further about the possibility of increasing the area ratio given the 330 bar max demonstrated chamber pressure. That essentially means tweaking the ratio of the nozzle exit area versus the throat area of the engine. Now Corey here has created a terrific animation of this first prototype test and how that may play out in the not too distant future. It's unbelievable to think that we may witness this soon. It's going to be super weird to see this massive booster do a test flight with nothing on top of it. Neo Pork here also created some beautiful artwork of some future components that we may soon see being assembled for such a booster prototype. Not sure if there will be a need for any grid fin controls for that first prototype flight if it is just a low altitude test. But they will certainly be used for higher altitude tests. So yes, it's great to see some activity going on with the super heavy booster there. Furthermore, SN9's forward dome was rolled outside ready for mating with the common dome. This stack has many unique features that were also seen on SN7.1's test tank. However, it is unknown what these parts will be used for. SN10's common dome stack was also brought outside and its aft dome was sleeved. SN11's aft dome and leg skirt was also spotted by Mary and this can be seen in Brendan SN11 diagram. When comparing this new skirt to that of SN7.1's, a huge visual difference in welding techniques can be seen. SN11 skirt is still missing the mounting points for the legs, but the difference is still clear with less visible and smoother welds. 
To High Bay News, the roof scaffolding could be seen being placed down. It shouldn't be long now until we see the High Bay completed. That we estimate to be around 81 metres tall and just check it out in comparison to the Mid Bay for scale. It is truly a massive structure. Yet another nose cone was just recently completed as well. There are so many now that it's hard to guess which nose may be used for which starship. Perhaps this one could be for serial number 8 or another future starship. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Along with all of this, the two reinforced five ring segments were brought out to the back near the mid bay ahead of stacking with the nose cones. These sections sit in between and connect the nose cones to the tank sections. Now, Elon Musk revealed some information regarding Starship's landing. Neopork here tweeted a new render of the Starship landing and asked Elon if Starship aft flaps would stay folded after the flip maneuver. Elon responded saying most likely. All flaps will fold after landing to reduce wind tip over force. There may be some cases where flaps deployed help stability such as changes in wind direction, in which case one or more flaps may be extended. He also replied again to say that better legs for Starship are coming. We had hints of that in the past of course but perhaps the new legs will be coming sooner than what we may think time will tell now at the launch pad the thrust simulator that was originally at pad b for sn 7.1 testing was moved to pad a ahead of sn 8's cryo test furthermore ahead of sn 7.1's test to destruction the stand could be seen being anchored down with stainless steel coils to reduce the tip over factor seen with the sn 7 pop you gotta just love their high tech approach to these sorts of problems each of those steel rolls there is around 10 metric tons so SN 7.1 was not going anywhere. In the end of course that all worked perfectly fine as we witnessed just the other day after several attempts for a test to destruction throughout the week. Early Wednesday morning at 4.58am local time SN 7.1's end was finally sealed with that planned test to destruction launching a massive plume of liquid nitrogen into the air. What an amazing sight yet again. As you can see here the top of the tank itself seems to have have let go, allowing that full pressure inside the tank to launch that liquid nitrogen skyward. Just check that out. The tank itself there barely moved, so those massive stainless steel rolls seem to have done the trick. Huge thanks there to the team at NASA Spaceflight for tirelessly streaming through three whole nights of testing just to capture this one shot. Seems <laughs> like a bummer. It seems like maybe SN 7.1 lives another day. Yeah, or, or at least to two day because it's already like 5 a.m. That is huge dedication. And of course, Mary out there all night after already filming at Boca Chica all day. Wow, just wow. Please, everyone, do what you can to support that work. That is such incredible dedication right there. And we thank you sincerely for all this. Mauricio, who has been providing these incredible sky views of the construction and launch sites, has just recently taken these images. All the support for RGV aerial photography on Patreon has been hugely beneficial, so thanks to everyone helping out there. The flights are on RGV's YouTube channel, linked in the description of these videos as well. All these photos and flight footage was taken on Thursday the 24th of September, so we can see SN7.1 there broken open, and we can also see all that activity going on around Starship SN8 and the rear flaps there. It is just amazing to see how much has changed just over the course of the last week. Also, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of you watching here as well for liking, subscribing, and commenting on these videos. We obliterated that goal of reaching 200,000 subscribers by October, all because of you. Along with that, last week's video even ended up on YouTube's trending feed as I passed that milestone. So thank you for your incredible support. On to a quarter million subscribers now. You guys are all amazing. Now SpaceX has a Starlink launch coming up very soon, so just keep an eye out on the social feeds over the next few days. The Falcon 9 is scheduled to launch the 13th batch of Starlink satellites. This booster will have its third flight, with this being the same beast that launched the Crew Dragon Demo 2 mission. That is the same booster with that worm logo on the side from that mission in May this year. It also boosted the Anasus 2 mission in July, so another rapid turnaround for this booster. As I'm sure many of you have spotted, it was reported a little over 
a week ago that SpaceX are planning to expand its testing of the Starlink network by demonstrating that it can be utilized on its drone ships and other ocean vessels. They had submitted a request for permission to test these user terminals on ships for a period of up to two years. The submitted FCC filing talks of deploying a total of 10 Earth stations on 10 vessels, which obviously includes the drone ships. So yes, we may well soon be seeing some clearer, uninterrupted landing footage, which would just be awesome. We were hoping to have seen that Starlink launch by now, of course, but there have been a number of delays on that. Some of those delays, I'm sure, are relating to the Delta IV Heavy, which has been postponed several times and is there sitting at the pad awaiting its next launch attempt. That should be coming in just days now. Likewise, we were hoping to have seen a launch of Blue Origin's new Shepard, but it's also been delayed several times from problems such as the announced power glitch. The last few weeks really have been filled with scrums, but it is likely going to turn into a busy upcoming week. Now, in other NASA-related news, it's been very cool continuing to watch the painting of NASA's massive 160-meter-tall vehicle assembly building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. And we've talked a lot about the new high bay at Boca Chica, which is only about half of that height. Look how massive that is, and then look at this. The VAB there is about double that height. Currently, the workers there are repainting the American flag on the massive, iconic building, and it's a big job too. That flag is around 64 meters tall. Tall, just one of the stars is apparently two meters wide. So yes, imagine having that job. It is an important job right now, of course, because crewed missions are finally launching again from the United States, as we witnessed with Crew Dragon's Demo 2 mission just months ago. And in October, we still have the Crew 1 mission coming up on SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Add to that the upcoming launches, hopefully next year, of the Space Launch System with Orion for Artemis, and there is a lot of reasons to make sure that the Space Center has had a good refresh. Now, speaking of Artemis, Artemis, NASA published the Artemis plan to land the first woman and next man on the moon in 2024. Last week, there was a little confusion when Jim Bridenstine seemed to suggest that NASA were open to a more equatorial site for the 2024 touchdown. Not sure where exactly that was coming from, because the plan still says that in 2024, Artemis 3 will be humanity's return to the surface of the moon, landing the first astronauts on the lunar South Pole. Jim himself said during a teleconference on the 21st of September that they were indeed going to the South Pole. As mentioned in the plan, while NASA has not made a final decision to use the gateway for Artemis 3, Artemis 4 and beyond will send crew aboard Orion to dock to the gateway, where two crew members can stay aboard the spaceship in orbit while two go to the surface. It is really exciting watching all of this new enthusiasm from the public now that crew are launching from the United States once again. Crew 1, as far as we know, is still scheduled in for a launch around October 23rd. That is now less than a month away, and this is a huge mission expected to last 210 days. That will have the Crew Dragon return to Earth sometime around June in 2021. So Relativity Space is a company I've not talked about in the past. This amazing team is attempting to build the first autonomous rocket factory and launch services for their customers. They are a four-year-old startup launch provider with a rocket called Terran 1 with a lift capacity of around 1.25 metric tons, but there is a neat twist to this company's mode of operation. Relativity Space was founded at the start of 2016 by CEO Tim Ellis, who was a propulsion engineer at Blue Origin, along with co-founder and now executive advisor Jordan Noon, who worked at SpaceX on Crew Dragon, specifically around the Draco engines. These guys are seriously amazing at what they want to achieve and are already achieving. With the core of their business based on a 95% 3D metal printed launch vehicle here, which is the Terran 1, this is an awesome setup for such young visionaries, claiming to have 100 times less parts than a typical rocket in its class, Relativity Space aims to eventually be able to create a launch vehicle from raw material to launch pad in, wait for it, just 60 days with an approximate cost at this time of about $10 million per launch. The 3D metal printers were essentially invented in-house with the capability to now print a component up to 36 feet tall. It's amazing to watch the revolution in rocket design and manufacture. To put this in context, here is a photo from 1977 showing the machine of an injector for the space shuttle main engine. It took two years to make that. Relativity printed this type of part in two weeks. Just as another example of that, the Aeon 1 engine itself can be printed in one month and it's got only three parts. 
With tanks tested to failure on many occasions, and at least 13 engine versions test fired over 300 times, the ability to 3D print these components, and more importantly right now, prove that printed components work, leaves no doubt that this is going to help change the industry. So what about where to launch from? That is not a problem either, with locations at Launch Complex 16 at Cape Canaveral and Building 330 at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Interestingly, Iridium have already signed up with Relativity to launch payloads for them from the west coast in the not too distant future. This is exciting stuff. Over to some interesting updates now from Firefly Aerospace. With a suite of future launch options to choose from, customers looking for a price competitive launch provider will be spoilt for choice, and Firefly is one of them for sure. We'll talk more about that shortly, but real quick, this video is sponsored by Brilliant, who have been incredible supporters of the channel here. In the current age of amazing online content, it's no surprise that people are taking the lead in their own learning instead of using outdated and inefficient forms of education. For those out there looking around for engaging online math and science resources, certainly check out the offering here with Brilliant. If you're a student looking to push ahead or a professional that wants to catch up on the latest topics or someone that just wants to learn how the universe ticks, you are going to love this. Every time I revisit the courses here, I find some amazing topics I didn't even realize that I wanted to know more about. Before long, I'm knee deep in a topic that takes me down a rabbit hole of new information to uncover. Just take this new course on knowledge and uncertainty. This gives you mathematical tools for dealing with the huge flood of information in our lives. When you think about it, there is just uncertainty everywhere. This material takes you through topics such as entropy, compression and information theory, but in an accessible way without calculations getting in the way. The emphasis here is on applying these ideas to deal with any uncertainty in your life. To give it a try and at the same time support us here on the channel, head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. You can head there from the link in the description below. So yes, Firefly Aerospace has some interesting upcoming launch options such as Firefly Alpha, which will be aiming for bi-monthly launches. This is a small satellite launch vehicle with the ability to lift one metric tonne to low Earth orbit or 630 kilograms to a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. And this will also be capable of catering for rideshare customers as well. Firefly Beta, while modeled on Alpha, was to be a two and a half stage option as shown here with the capability to lift four metric tonnes to a 200 kilometer low Earth orbit as well as being able to send payloads into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. Now, I say was, as there has been a recent change of plans. In late 2019, Firefly and Aerojet Rocketdyne entered into a strategic partnership with Beta, now planned to be a single core launch vehicle provided by an AR-1 engine. Now, this engine is capable of producing around 226 metric tons or 500,000 pounds of force at sea level, giving the Beta design the ability to almost double the lift capacity at eight metric tons into a low Earth orbit. At least the AR-1 engine now has a confirmed customer as well, as it was originally meant to power United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket. That changed, of course, with the Vulcan now planning to use Blue Origin's B4 engines on the first stage. It is good to know that the AR-1 is still hanging in there with Firefly Aerospace. Longer term, it's interesting looking at future designs such as the largely reusable vehicle named Firefly Gamma. That is planned to be a 75% reusable vehicle with air or ground launch capability and also the ability to land on an airport runway. Now just back to Alpha for a moment because we saw a test of the first stage this past week. Powered by four Reaver engines, a first flight is clearly not too far off with this nice 35 second burn test demonstration. With plenty of thrust vector movement here, this little baby can sure pack a punch. It has an overall length of 95 feet and the engines can belt out 165,000 pounds of thrust. This rocket company based in Texas began working on a privately developed liquid fueled rocket and they are well on their way now. There really is some super impressive work going on there. Now, big thanks to the wonderful patrons listed here. There is no way that we could continue creating content at this frequency and length without you. That valuable support there just helps us to increase the time we can spend, and that is all thanks to the growing list of names we can see right there. It is a real team effort at this point, and all that assistance helps the whole crew. So if you like what we're doing and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can have earlier access 
list of videos to watch before anyone else. And you can also have your names listed right here like all of these other incredible people. Just as importantly though, for everyone watching, simply subscribing, liking, sharing, and commenting makes a massive difference. If you love following the space industry, just sharing this information to family and friends helps create a fundamental shift in everyone's perspective. We all want to see that passion grow worldwide as we get closer to once again exploring the moon and soon Mars with boots on the ground. It is you guys helping to drive this global passion forward. Share some love as well for the team behind the channel. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of all this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about Starship Serial Number 8, updates with Dynetics and their prototypes for the human landing system, and the launch failure of Astra's rocket. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.